Greetings, I am Erin Patton, metaphysical master in a millennial age, and it is my life's purpose to guide you and organizations along an enlightened path. So I invite you to sit comfortably and tune in as I welcome you to the Meta Business Millennial, where we get the real conversations you won't get in the boardroom so that we understand this is exactly the path we need to be on in order to grow, evolve, and thrive. Greetings. Welcome to the Meta Business Millennial. I am Erin Patton, also known as Master L, and I'm here today with the founder of House and Beautiful Business, Tim, and I'm so honored that he's dialing in from Madrid, Spain. <laughs> Yes, uh, and, uh, and, and I, we're going to talk about where you're from because um, we'd love to understand people who are across the pond. Like, what are they doing in the metaphysical world, the business world? And I was just sharing with Tim how I I got hit to House of Beautiful Business, and that was through my my friend, one of my first clients, Andy Zimmerman, who actually wrote the book Journey, the metaphysical <laughs> novel, and was the CEO of Frog Design Company. And I believe I've done some work with you, Tim, and your team um, before. And so, um, so yeah, so he told me about House of Beautiful Business. I've been following them now for the past two years. I'm incredibly inspired by the conversations they're having around business, the, the unlike minds that they, the unlike minded community that they have, <laughs> and how everyone really is in, encouraged and um and hold the space for differences of thought, differences of voices in business where we always are kind of looking like lemmings, you know? And so I, without further ado, I want to welcome Tim to the show. Welcome. <laughs> Hi, it's really great to be here. And thank you so much for the invitation. Yes. And um, I would love for you to just get into the, the basics. So this is what I do with everyone. Where are you from? How did you grow up? Um, because, you know, a lot of people like us have had the traditional upbringing and then they're like, how the hell did you end up where you are now? You know, um, so really just kind of give us a sense of of kind of what your journey has been like today. today. Yeah, sure. Uh, gosh, yeah. I mean, I kind of feel like I'm actually at a point in my life where it feels like a homecoming. So I'm a big believer that there are these like your life's not circular or elliptical in a way, and I think part of our, you know, it's this long journey of actually coming home and finding out who you really are. Yes. And you don't, you sort of know that often. I mean, at least I think I did when I was younger, like when I was in my teenage years, surprisingly, I think I had many of the pursuits and passions that are now my profession in a way, but it's taken me some time to get there. So long story short, I, I was born and raised in Germany in the southern part of Germany. So I born near Frankfurt. I grew up in Stuttgart, which is like, you know, uh, the Detroit of Germany. <laughs> so okay. that, like it's the headquarters of Porsche, of Daimler, right? It's where the car was actually invented by Gottlieb Daimler and Carl Benz. There's a lot of sort of automobile uh, history, very industrial um, city. And uh, go ahead. I used to live in Detroit, so that's a really cool. Okay, uh, that, <laughs> well, I'm just making this analogy because Detroit, of course, used to be you know sort of the big uh, car uh, capital. And yeah, and I had a fairly you know very middle class German, safe, nice childhood. Like you know, there wasn't any kind of existential threat. I think I grew up knowing that I would go to university. I would probably get a decent job. You know, life was pretty linear. Yeah. Uh, so, in, you know, I mean, in the 80s, basically, I grew up with 80s music and then there was Chernobyl and there were some disruptions, you know, sort of to my idyllic worldview, but more or less, it was a very solid, stable, safe environment that I grew up mm -hmm. in. I was always very interested. My grandfather was a filmmaker, a uh, documentary filmmaker, and my father is a businessman. My mother was in law. So I always had these two strands of you know business on the one hand so a kind of very pragmatic uh practical mindset that mm -hmm. i sort of inherited from my parents but at the same time i guess through my parents but particularly through my grandfather whom i'd never met because he died before i was born i think there's also sort of an artistic streak there's a creative pursuit and i've always been very interested from my childhood days and in, in the intersection of the sweet spot between the two so when i was 12 you know i was sort of I created my own publishing company, you know, like a fake 
publishing company. I did. Uh, I loved radio. I was listening to radio day and night, and, and I kind of launched my own, you know, fictitious radio show with my younger brother. You know, yeah. I had to listen to my radio shows, um, and you know, and I was a football commentator. I was playing with toys and kind of did some fake commentary. So I was always very interested in media and audience and curation and content and ideas and publishing. Um, and then I, I played in a band. I played, uh, I made music. I released two albums. And, you know, and then for some reason, because I wanted to play it safe and I felt like mm, I need to fit into the system, I studied law, mm. uh, which I thought was intellectually interesting, but it wasn't really my passion. And then it took me a while to get back to, uh, to sort of uh, my creative um, interests and desires. And then I, I basically started my professional career in marketing, which appeared to me as like the corporate function where that, you know, creative desire of mine would have been sort of best accommodated. And that turned out to be true, mostly. Yeah. And uh, and then I, you know, basically I, I worked in several uh, capacities um, in Germany in creative positions as a writer, concept developer, and then I moved for grad school. I moved to Los Angeles, and uh, mm-hmm. then worked for Frog Design, where Andy Zimmerman, whom you mentioned earlier, the joint connection that we have, also yeah. and then became CEO. So I was the CMO there. Wrote a book called The Business Romantic, and that came out in 2015. Uh, wrote another book in German, not in English, about the end of winning. And I guess, long story short, I think the this interest in metaphysics, mysticism, spirituality has had always been there, more or less. I remember even as a um, when I made music, for example, that was a very heartfelt sentiment that I felt when I was on stage or I wrote songs. I was very aware of the fact that, that I was privileged to connect with a power that was greater than yes. what I could empirically grasp or greater than myself. You know, there was some magic there. Yes. And I was very interested in religion and spirituality and cults and, you know, so anything that is in, in, in the unknown, anything that was elusive, non-quantifiable. And I was very deeply suspicious of anybody who wanted to explain the world to me on mere scientific empirical terms. I always felt like if that's interesting and I admire it, but I always felt like that cannot be like, if that's the whole truth, that's depressing. There must be more mm-hmm. to it. And I'm not even sure I want to understand it all. You know, I just want to feel it. I want to intuit it. I want to sense it. I want to be aware of it, but I don't necessarily need to formalize it or quantify it. So Ooh. that's the backdrop also for the work of the House of Beautiful Business and for the business romantic, where I looked at romanticism as an antidote to dataism and, you know, scientific rationality and how it plays out in business. And yeah, now um, I'm actually working on a book about the metaphysical economy, I guess, is sort of the working title, because I do feel that finally these these sort of themes and these strands of life, and especially like spirituality or metaphysics, which had been long excluded from modern management and business, of course, yeah. it's now coming in full force. And I think it yeah. needs to connect and it belongs together. And it's absolutely fascinating to see that in the wake of at the same time the crazy development that we're seeing with exponential technology chat gpt generative ai and other sort of yes. real breakthroughs we've recently witnessed sorry that was a long answer to you no, great. <laughs> i'm old so <laughs> i'm not 20 anymore so it takes me some time to like go walk you through my life <laughs> well this podcast is about you you're my guest so I, i'm interviewing you so you, this is your show for real like this is your show <laughs> and I want to thank you so much for sharing that because there were so many aspects of your life and your upbringing that resonated with me the creativity the exploration the 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 ma- finding the marriage between the two in your career it's really beautiful that you were able to still incorporate your passions in that which you do when I had shared with you before that a lot of our listeners are either trying to do that or seeking to do that, or maybe doing that now. And it's not very common for us to be able to really have that um, that balance between our, our, our feminine aspects. You, know, you talked about the, the intuitive, the creative, the nurturing aspects, and then the logic, you know, the practicality mm. and all of that. So that's really beautiful that you are able to find that. And most importantly, 
the metaphysical economy it just makes my heart sing, my little soul, soul bird sing, because this is exactly where we have to go if we want to be able to involve in, the, in what I call the new earth paradigm. Um, and, and if we aren't, then we're really not utilizing our full potential because I always like to bring in my Tai Chi knowledge. So along with being a yoga instructor, I'm a Tai Chi master. And in Tai Chi, we always talk about our, our bodies. We have three bodies, our physical body, our energy body, and our emotional body. And when we come and show up to work, we're usually always in our physical Every now and then we may get a little bit emotional, but where is the energy? Where is the soul? Where is the spiritual aspect? And that's a third of ourselves that we're, we've completely eliminated, but actually it is the most, has the most infinite potential. <laughs> um, and so I love that you're able to really tap into that. And before we get into that book, though, I would love for you to start to maybe articulate what maybe is there a catalytic moment in your life? that started to awaken you to, to this metaphysical um, path. Because I, I always talk about it in my podcast, like in my first one, I did my whole life story. I had a lot of trauma, a lot of challenges that the universe was like, you wake your ass up. You know, like basically, <laughs> you know, is there a story that you can point to or a series of events maybe that really a, a, made you wake up and say, there's something deeper beyond the empirical. Mm. Yeah, it, it, I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time pinpointing like one like catalytic event, you know, that was transformative. And that was really like this sort of paradigm shifting event for me. It was more like an accumulation of experiences. So my my grandmother was actually quite religious. You know, I grew up as a Roman Catholic. So mm. I just ended up also, you know, I wasn't particularly religious in terms of like the faith of Roman Catholicism, but I was interested in it. And I also, I think, because I wanted to please her, I went to church quite often. And mm -hmm. uh, and I was fascinated by the rituals. I was fascinated that these these institutions had these long-held traditions and that, you know, there's still a Vatican and at the same time, there's blockchain. I mean, isn't it amazing? <laughs> like the, the staying power of these institutions and the yes. authority with all of the, you know, justified criticism, you know, of course, it's a very controversial, there are very controversial institutions, but there is so much wisdom in, in any religion, really, any faith, of course. And that always fascinated me. And I guess I had, so that was just like the exposure, right? So there was an openness there because I just experienced faith, I think, firsthand. And then I think it was mostly music, frankly. So I, I started listening to music. I remember listening to Van Morrison's Astral Weeks, which is very much like one of the seminal albums, you know, I think it was from the 70s or 60s, actually. Mm. 70s, I think. Um, that kind of like brought mysticism to life. And of course, it's always part of any kind of music. There's always a mystical layer to it. But he addressed right. it in, in his lyrics. And it today, right, it's sort of considered like one of those sort of mystical albums and I was listening and likewise also uh talk talk you know uh I remember uh, uh I think it was the color of Eden was the name of the album like moments when I was 12 14 and I was very happy and had friends but I was also very lonely as one is you know sort of soul searching and I had these moments where I felt like what is the deeper meaning of it all I was asking big questions unfortunately we kind of then like we we don't do that anymore like once we're on a career path right the big questions kind of suddenly disappear and it's all about getting ahead and making life work and and so forth but when you're younger you you think about these big questions and I was finding yeah. I was trying to find answers in music in in theater in literature mm. uh, so I read a lot and and I had these moments I remember sitting in a car you know at night and listening to talk talk you know on Miles Davis I'm just like oh my god there's what is happening? You know, there's something powerful here. There's a force that I don't quite comprehend that deeply touches me on a level that I can't explain. And then I began to write my own music and play music and play it in a band. And I sang and played guitar and we recorded and two albums um, and did a lot of live shows. And that was another moment when I made music on stage where I realized that, um, you know, there's something happening where, I mean, this sounds sort of dramatic, but I, where we were the media, right, for, for a spirit that kind of was 
channeled through us. Yes. And there were moments that there were moments that were really bad because you know um, we kind of messed it up. But there were, were but there were moments that were just like so synchronized and so beautiful and so magical. And I think it helped me develop a, a kind of a sensibility for a sensitivity for you know like yeah sort of some spiritual force. And then I worked in Silicon Valley, you know, for, for 10 or more years. So very much, you know, in a, I mean, at least on the surface, very much the opposite of a broader spiritual worldview. And in the nineties and the early, you know, two thousands, I think there was a lot of like data is right. The belief that if we only have the data and the numbers and we quantify, then we can craft any possible solution to any individual or societal problem, a very myopic worldview, which I always felt like, ah, it's just, this optimization efficiency based world where it's just so reduction is so narrow. And then I wrote my book, The Business Romantic, which was really, I think, kind of a, a manifesto against this kind of worldview, very mm. much like the romantics in the 18th, 19th century had been the, you know, the rebels against the enlightenment the sentiment, the prevailing sentiment of the time. And I remember even having this conversation with uh, my publisher and agent saying that well this is in a way it was a spiritual book it alluded to the non the unknown and the mysterious and the mystique but i think i was shying away from the term spirituality because it seemed a bit woo woo and it didn't yes. seem to de legitimize you know the effort yeah and i think we're now at a point where where you talked about the emotional body right so cognition of course intellect is is has always been legitimate in management of this sort of false illusion of logic and rationality. We can discuss whether that actually exists. Yeah. <laughs> but, but then, but then I think in the past 10 years, right, there's been sort of this rise of emotional intelligence. And yes, now we need to show up with our full selves, which means emotional diversity, negative emotion. So there's much more permission for that. But I think the what's still like lacking, and this is why your work is so is so important and so amazing, is is mm -hmm. now really bringing the spiritual, the metaphysical, a different language and different practices into this equation, right? And I think the big, the big, I would say, sort of quantum sh leap now that that is needed is that we're transcending this belief we, that we need all these tools, you know, whether that's yoga, meditation, tai chi, reiki, mindfulness, emotional intelligence. I think business has incorporated some of these practices, but always under the kind of premise of enhancing productivity. So they were instrumentalists. They were like, yeah, we need that. Those are great mm -hmm. hacks for the mind so we can think better, be more productive, produce better outcomes. And that's true, right? There is a correlation. And I think that's a good case to be made in the current terms of management. But I think what we're seeing now and what I'm hoping to provoke with my work in the House of Beautiful Business and the book, and maybe you as well with your work, is I think is something that is actually much more fundamental where we actually looking at the building blocks of the economy, our definitions of value, our definitions of success, of growth, and actually challenge them through a metaphysical mindset rather than just saying, hey, we incorporate some metaphysical practices just to produce more, you know, to be more successful or advance our careers. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the, the big shift. And I, in the mm -hmm. past uh, two years or so, I've, I've talked to several people who, like either from a very corporate position actually branched out into some of these metaphysical practices or are deeply rooted in, you know, uh, religious or mystical practices. So um, actually my ex-partner was, was um, you know, very into Kabbalah and taught about Kabbalistic wisdom and combined it with embodiment and dance and, mm. uh, and life coaching. And I learned a lot about like just that, you know, the tree of life and Kabbalistic wisdom and really fascinated me because it, it was very foreign to me um, before I, I spent time with her. So long story, <laughs> long answer again, but there's been a number of these, these um, I think, experiences of people. I met. quite frankly, I had the real great um, sort of privilege to meet in my life who kind of like inspired me and brought me to to engage with these topics and then I think at the same time like the the business world is moving there as well closer and that has also kind of surrounded me and prompted me to to think about these topics oh my god this is so good because again there's a lot of resonance too and I think this is why we do the work that we do is that we find that there's so much connectivity between people who are just so different and I too had a, a Roman Catholic upbringing like I was an altar server all those things and didn't even try to 
conceptualize how the, that ritualistic upbringing really completely informed why I'm so attracted to that work now. And, and what I really want to dig into based on what you were saying was this idea around the metaphysical and the outcomes. Because interestingly enough, as I you know pitch my business to folks that aren't as in tune, that's the first metric that I point to. Well-being affects business outcomes. Well-being affects creativity, collaboration, decision-making. And I would love to get to a little bit deeper into what you were discussing around us redefining what our values are fundamentally. Um, as we show up in business, you know, what, what is the success? What are the some of the success metrics? What are some things that, you know, I, there was a post even on LinkedIn yesterday that I shared um, about like uh, burnout doesn't just affect, you know, I think it was like, oh, burnout is like $200 billion in losses from gap. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But also burnout affects people and families, <laughs> which, which he was like, that's the most salient point. You know, Mm -hmm. it affects us. And this is something, too, that, you know, in business, having gone to Harvard Business School, our duty as managers, as leaders, is always our our fiduciary one. Other than that, we don't give a shit about anything else. And that, to me, never sat well with me. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to, to like, go a little bit deeper around this conversation, around what what can we start to socialize Mm -hmm around business and metrics and performance to beyond the profits, because I know you care, but they may not yet, but there has to, we have to start talking about it. I feel like. Mm -hmm. Such a good question. You know, it has always bothered me. Like let's, let's take diversity, for example, DEI, Mm -hmm. diversity, equity, and inclusion Mm -hmm. or sustainability for that matter. Yes. So I think like, if you look at ESG and other uh, frameworks, I think for what it's worth, right, the lowest common denominator is to say diversity is great because it's good for business, you know, (laughs) sustainable is good because it's good for business, right? That's sort of how we tend to make the case to a business audience. And that is maybe effective and maybe that is the gate we have to go through. Part of me thinks the other half of me is thinking, no way. Like, where does this come from? This sort of false idea that we like who do we talk to like i guess we're talking to an audience that is just afraid you know middle management or senior managers and looking for for sort of like us making a case that they can take to their bosses to say well let's do this because it's good for business right yes. but maybe that is just sort of like a false premise and maybe that's just sort of a myth and um that we you know that we need to cater to that rather than actually undertaking a much more radical effort and to say you know, energy to stay with Reiki or other other energy practices. Sure, you can say, and there's lots of research that's good for your well-being. Well-being is good for a culture of psychological safety. A culture of psychological safety is making your culture more productive and innovative, right? There is a direct quantifiable correlation between these inputs and these practices and the outcomes. Yeah. And that's great. But in a metaphysical economy, that's just the beginning. The metaphysical economy defines a business as a business that actually creates energy that yeah. it puts back into the world rather than yeah. absorbing energy to make the business goals, you know, to meet the business goals. Yeah. So I think that's the shift, you know, mm. that we look at that and, and sustainability is not only good for business. No, sustainability is good for humanity. Yeah. Diversity is good for families and people. It's not just good for business. That's not why we should do it. Business yeah. is the instrument, is the tool, you know, is a very powerful, I think, force and a powerful arena for that. So I think that's the that's the difference. But I understand, you know, there. So I, I think the strategy for for me at least is to do both. To say yes, if you're looking for like very you know tangible metrics, let's take the human design energy framework. Uh, that is actually really gaining in popularity right now. We yes. just did an interview with um, Julie Fedele, who works at Liberty Global Media and calls herself a corporate mystic and actually offers that on the side, uh, you know, to, to executives. And, and I feel like human design specifically is actually very digestible for a corporate mm-hmm. audience because it's not like the, the, the language is not too esoteric, even though it has spiritual roots, but it has very practical applications, right? So okay. understanding what type of energy 
uh, type you are, what that means for your ability to collaborate, to, to create in a business context, to lead, and then assemble in teams and hire accordingly is, is of immediate you know, business value. So I think that's a good kind of gateway. So you can do all of that, right? So you can point to all the research and all of the outcomes and the benefits of these practices. But then I always try to say, but in addition, you know, here's the really holy grail. Here's the next frontier, which is turn your business into a metaphysical physical business. Like look at the fundamentals of your business, the way you measure, the way you define success, your culture, and really make it a metaphysical culture rather than just like integrating these practices to the effect of boosting management objectives that are, you know, from the past decade or so. Mm. And I think if we do both, maybe that's sort of a two-prong, you know, strategy that that works. I don't know what, what, what your experience is or how your messaging resonates or how you deal with these corporate audiences, but at least that's that's where I am right now. I love that because one thing that you said that deeply resonated with me was we're always considering the inputs of the metaphysical training and not really looking at the output of what the, this business, the ripple effect that it's creating in the world. And for me, that's fundamentally what I believe metaphysics, meta, meta business purpose is, is to help lift human consciousness and, and lift the vibration of the planet. And we do that by the energy we put out. And that's cultivated by the energy that we, that we, you know, create within. And for me to kind of respond to your question, I look at the micro changes. You know, if we aren't looking at our changes as individuals, then organizational healing can't happen. And you know, I always talk about organizational dis-ease and organizational healing. That's the work that meta business is. Yet it starts with the individual because the individuals comprise the organization. And that's something too that I believe has been lost in business is the individual. What is the individual experience? What does the admin go through versus the middle manager versus the janitor or the, the upper level management? Because everyone has a role to play in the success of this organization. And if we aren't considering the energy that each of these components bring, then we are not considering the whole. And so that to me is kind of the, the, the approach that I look at it, the lens that I look at it through, yet also the energy that we put out is what's going to affect ultimately mm -hmm. you know what's in the world and how our world evolves and it is interesting now listening to you right and talking about healing that that like maybe 10 years ago people would have completely like shaken their head like oh god healing what the heck like healing is for hospitals or for massage therapists but not but now, you know, there, I, for, I forgot the name of the author, but there is a book about um, the healing leader that just came out a few months ago. So mm. healing as a leadership quality. Uh, Bayo Akomalaf, a Nigerian philosopher whom we work with at the House of Beautiful Business, yeah. just hosted a session with us on the unbusiness-like nature of business and, and actually like talking about trauma. Uh, Gabo Mate, you know, his book is really very popular right now, talks about trauma uh, in in the sort of the myth of normal, right? Really like acknowledging that we're all traumatized more or less through big or small events in our lives. And because we spend so much time at work and it's such an identity, you know, defining uh, workplace, it, it has businesses such power and responsibility to heal. Yes. And it might perhaps be one of the remaining, you know, not, not the only one, but a very, very important responsibility of business is to heal is to heal us as individuals but also to heal our disconnect with nature to heal in our environment uh to heal the scars and the wounds you know that we have suffered from because of a very technocratic very inhumane uh system that many of us were part of and so i think that's a i think it's just a beautiful notion and I like, you know, I think always that change happens by first coining different language, like romanticism, like in my case, or metaphysics, right? Language that you now are also introducing, which is amazing, or healing, right? Suddenly, it's a bit uncomfortable, but then suddenly, I think, after a few years or months, it kind of sinks in, and then the language becomes practice, and the practice becomes process, and the process becomes okay. system, Good. And then it's a new paradigm and change is actually happening. A hundred percent. And like how you said, it's a process, it's a program. And, and, and one thing too, that started to resonate with me deeply around that was, you know, the energy that we bring 
And and, and what I want to get to um, a little bit more is asking you around how do you maybe even cultivate this culture in your own business? Um, because you know this is a meta business millennial, and and we want to understand like practical application. And for you in the House of Beautiful Business per se, with your founder, your team, are there any rituals or practices that you bring to the table, or that you guys engage that maybe get at some of this metaphysical <laughs> existence? <laughs> It helps. <laughs> you, you'd be shocked to hear that we're, we're, we're in a way, it's interesting, like the, the experiences that we create and the people we invite and the platform that we create for them is probably makes you think that we do, we go on an ayahuasca retreat every day, you know, <laughs> and we sit in silence and meditate, you know, every other day and we pray and we do Reiki and, you know, and other but so we did some uh, human design, you know, kind of applications and looked at our team. But frankly, like we were not doing much, not enough. And also because I think when you're a startup and and I think we're so outward facing, we're, we're thinking about like, okay, what's the next newsletter about? What's the, like, can we put on, like, what kind of experience can we put on at our next festival? So this is sort of how we think, but we, we are not so much looking at our own culture. Probably we, we should. It's just like we're so like obsessed with creating something that is out there in the world that we don't even take much time to contemplate or sit with ourselves. So that being said, I mean, we we do work a lot with dancers and we had performances of dancers and also dancers come to our you know team summits. Uh, we did silent sessions. It's something we do at the House of Beautiful Business, where the last hour of every big festival is in silence. It's a beautiful mm -hmm. moment. We just sit with everything that happened silently. Um, we also do silent dinners. Um, and, you know, we do events like, for example, at the upcoming The Dream Festival in June in, in Portugal, yes. a main gathering, we'll have a living funeral. So we'll have actually a doula and grief explorer stage a living funeral where you can uh, experience witness your own funeral uh, staged of course um, so those are types sort of some of the the very profound religious experiences we do a tarot card reading we have human design workshop there we do um a, a, we have an you know astro reader basically looking at the stars but uh, and I know that our team members are very interested in it some of them at least and have experiences and some of them privately have gone on, on much more in-depth explorations in terms of plant-based medicine, uh, religious experiences and pilgrimages and so forth. But I don't think we've done it as a, as a business or as a culture, which is, oh, I think we should. It's, I think it's just a, it's an omission in a way, you know, I, I don't know why we haven't done it. I think we're just like, it's the start a lot of things. Of <laughs> <laughs> we should eat our own dog food. Well, you named a lot of things that y'all are doing, like a silent dinner, like a silent, I mean, the oh, it's incorporated in, in your being, it seems like. So you don't have to do it per se. You know what I'm saying? So and also it seems like the people that you attract are already cultivating these practices on their own. Like to our earlier point, it starts first with the individuals and they can then just show up and then do the work. And it comes almost naturally, if you will. So it doesn't have to be so prescriptive. And then you have like all these beautiful ideas that align with your, your intentions. And so that's really great. And I really want to start to get into the metaphysical economy a little bit more because this is just, you know, completely in alignment with meta business. And, and so far, like what, what has been your findings? And, and we already kind of talked about the inspiration, but I mean, you probably just started kind of jotting down notes and things, but, but what could this be? metaphysical economy look like in the future potentially <laughs> yeah i think i believe right now maybe just like just one one second on the one minute on the on the backdrop of this which is i think right now what's happening is just like this big convergence of, of two major trends um in light of our life that's increasingly virtualized and digital and exponentially digital i think there's a great also because of the pandemic and and how that Sort of put us back in touch with nature. I think we're seeing a big renaissance of like a, a desire to reconnect with the flesh, with the soil, with earth, with the natural, right? So on the one hand, in the form of somatic 
intelligence, body awareness, understanding our body and how our body is part of the, the body of nature, right? Sort of reconnecting with that. I think that's one big trend in sort of going on walks, coming home to, to nature, coming home to earth. Mm -hmm. um, the other trend is in light of advances in neuroscience and psychedelics and plant-based medicine becoming more legitimate and entering mainstream and uh, in growing research on their healing powers, of course, uh, is I think is a desire to expand our consciousness, right? To see that that there are that we can push the the boundaries there, and that we are part of a super mind or a collective consciousness or an ecology of thinking that transcends ourselves and our individual self interests. So I think there's there's a need to reconnect, sort of going down to the earth, and at the same time going up to a new level of consciousness that is either fueled by ancient wisdom or religious practices, spirituality, but of course now through technology and this insane uh, breakthrough that we're seeing with generative AI, yeah. it's also of course fueled by AI, right? AI is constituting right in front of our eyes a new consciousness, a new form of intelligence, yes. uh, perhaps even emotionality, right? A same, yes. same thing being, who knows, who are we to judge? And, and I think that's really fascinating. And in light of that, you know, there is a need, I think, to become meta, like really going above and, and high up in the sky and look at us from there. And at mm -hmm. the same time, to, to be very physical and be mm -hmm. grounded in the physicality again. So I, I look at the term metaphysical, which is traditionally a branch of philosophy that looks at the big questions of life and that that is not quantifiable, not empirically, you know, testable. Uh, spiritual questions, but I, I look at the term metaphysical also as this, uh, you know, kind of uh, combination of meta and physical. Yes. And and I think I just read a column by by Ezra Klein in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago about AI, and I think it was him who said, in light of this, the advancements with generative AI and perhaps uh, general artificial intelligence in, a, in, a, in the very near future. So emotions, we will not be able to discern whether. Uh, what is actually a, a representation of emotions and what is genuine emotions, it might not even matter anymore. So I'm not sure if emotions are going to be the big differentiator between humans and machines much longer. Mm -hmm. But what is a differentiator, and that was his point, is metaphysics. So it's it's yeah. really like a spiritual being that probably machines cannot master or relate to. And at the same time, AI might also, is it's kind of introducing a new reality um, you know, it's creating its own reality, if you will. So there's also something mystical about AI because it's kind of like a cathedral, like a black box that only a select number of interpreters and high priests of AI have access to translating that new knowledge that we no longer comprehend mm. because the territory is kind of exceeding the map, bringing back to us. So there's something spiritual, mystical also about, I think, this new domain of artificial intelligence mm. that I find deeply fascinating. So in light of all of that, I think yeah. the opportunity right now is to, yeah, to create an economy that is deeply influenced by this thinking. So that allows for, you know, ancient wisdom, allows for um, psychedelic practices, not just, again, not just as a boost to productivity or well-being, but as a business model. There's actually an interesting organization in, in the, I think, uh, in, in the U.S. called Project North Star looking at what psychedelic practices mean, like how they translate into psychedelic business models, like, which means if you understand ourselves as part of a broader ecology, maybe we're less competitive. Maybe it's not about winning at all costs. Mm -hmm. So I think those are some of the tenets of a metaphysical economy. It's an economy that creates spiritual value for those around it, that honors all life. It's life-centered, not just human-centered. Yes. That is humble in a way of it acknowledging its position in the broader universe that offers a seat at the table, you know, to nature that um, maybe relies on intuition or some spiritual attunement that is not logically explicable. So not just following the data, but a, a broader sort of source of wisdom that, um, yeah, that offers places of belonging and practices of belonging as part of its corporate mandate, rather than just looking at the bottom line, that is looking at the how, not just the, you know, the outcome 
And I could go on and on. That is deeply embedded in nature. I find co-designing with nature, deep technology, synthetic biology. I find in all of these applications, I find metaphysical elements. You know, again, reconnecting with nature and at the same time pushing the boundaries of human consciousness. I think both vectors are the, the two key vectors at the heart of this new economy that is emerging. But it's very nascent. And I think, you know, it's not, of course, you, you can't say, oh, Derek, this is a metaphysical company yet. It's a vision. But I, I think for me personally, looking at it, I don't know about you, but the people I talked to, what I'm sensing is this is unstoppable. This is it. This is the next big yeah, it's not revolution. Period. <laughs> Here for it. All of it. And I think all these ideas were just coming up in my head when you were talking specifically about the generative AI and the ability for, for machines to emote. And I, I've started, I've, I actually went through this. I don't know. Have you ever heard of holacracy? Mm -hmm. I went through holacracy training recently and also just started thinking about my own experience at Harvard Business School and in business in general, and just thinking about the history of business and how business just fundamentally was initially designed and it came out of a, a military tradition. Even Harvard Business School, um, after, it was established after World War II and all of its students were former military leaders um, or you know, captains, whatever. And even to this day, there is a certain percentage of students that are coming from Navy, are coming from Marines, Army, et cetera. And so it goes without saying that the hierarchical structure, the military is a strategic structure of business is really war-like and war-driven and, and really kind of lacks that, that divine spiritual aspect. And then when we think about human beings, even how we were being used in business in the 20th century, 18th century, we were just machines, essentially. We were just, you know, widgets that were part of, you know, you know, a strategy for a specific outcome. So our our nature wasn't even really valued. It wasn't even necessary, you know, at the time. And sadly, we're still operating by those primary tenants. And we have evolved, you know, light years from, the, from the, that time. And, and even when we're thinking about machines and the human being, the only thing that differentiates us is our divine nature, is our souls, is that we have souls. And so if we're not tapping into our soul, then we aren't act actualizing, optimizing our full potential. So mm -hmm. we have no choice but to evolve in this direction because this is the only thing that differentiates us from any other entity on the planet. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. And, and you're absolutely right. You know, the, the sort of the military command and control tradition of management. And also, by the way, of course, the colonial you know, uh, uh, heritage of, of capitalism as a system, right? And now I think we're seeing a softening, a, um, yeah, maybe it's about healing, it's about cooperation rather than competition, right? So there's different values, I think, that finding their way in into the system. And maybe we have to, you know, kind of like overhaul or change um, the, the entire um, system. So, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, I definitely uh, see that happening. Yeah. And I know we're kind of getting close to the time here, but I want to just ask you one final question. And that's really around like the future of your work, um, because this is about Tim. So I would love for you to share with our listeners, our viewers, you know, how they can engage with you. What is it that you have coming down the pipeline that, you, that you're most excited about? Mm -hmm. And the other kind of closing thoughts you might have on our conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. This has been so much fun. I'm, I'm really inspired just by, you know, it's interesting sort of to find like a, an ally or someone who has already been thinking about all of this. It's amazing. And um, yeah, I mean, I think for us, it's interesting Like the, for the House of Beautiful Business, we started in 2017 as a, an organization that was very much, it was on the heels of my book that was bringing emotions back to business, talking about purpose. And I think, the the language we used was also being human centered and it's really evolved right so now we're talking about life centered rather than human centered and rather than just focusing on emotions and emotional intelligence it's now actually a spiritual language that we're also honing and mm. bringing to to business that's the big kind of shift and that's 
now for us, the next frontier and also the theme of our upcoming festival, the dream, right? So we want to dream. We go into the subconscious, uh, the expanding consciousness, drawing from indigenous and ancient wisdom, religious practices. But I think our role is, and that's, I think, going back to what I said at the very beginning of our conversation, I've always had this sort of dualist kind of, you know, uh, mind because of my upbringing, business and art, uh, religion, and a very pragmatic kind of middle class sort of orientation. And, and I think that's also what the House of Beautiful Business is good at. That's that's kind of like our sweet spot and maybe the responsibility or the power that we have, our more, relatively modest power that we have is to be a bridge, you know, so we can talk to Siemens or, you know, um, uh, I don't know, other Fortune 500 companies or BCG, you know, yeah. and other partners of ours. And at the same time, we can have a tarot card reader and we can talk about human design. So we can bring together these two worlds because we both understand the corporate and speak the corporate language and to understand their needs and the pragmatism. But at the same time, we have our antennas out, you know, and have access to a network of really interesting people, path, you know, basically pacemakers and pioneers in that space. And I think what, what our role is and what our mission is to bring this together, right, to create a, a safe space to bring these two together. And for me personally, what I'm excited about is I think I'm just going through sort of this big transformation myself, you know, that I feel like, look, I'm a very intellectual person. So yeah. I, and and the way I explain this even, but I'm I also am very aware of my shortcomings. And in the past few years, I've just been exposed to experiences and met people who have profoundly um, changed the way I look at the world and I see myself. And I'm just at the beginning of this journey and writing this book is is this journey in a way. And it's a very deeply, it's a very personal endeavor and it's feeding into the house, but it's also something that is in a way my own pursuit. And I think it's, I, I feel, I'm I'm just fascinated by it, and I I I like that it's an open ended. I don't know what will be the end of it or where this is gonna land, mm -hmm. but I'm just like super inspired by it. Yeah, <laughs> I must say that it also is refreshing. It's humbling. And it's gratifying to be able to have these deep conversations with you. I hope to continue these conversations. I'm also like considering like, how am I going to get to this festival in June? Please, please, Erin, you are very much, you should come, you should speak. In fact, we should host, host conversations. Please come. Honestly, I'll, I'll follow up with you once we're, we're done with the recording. Yeah. Yes, we'd be very much willing to host conversations yeah. and do, do a recording. We can do the podcast. We can do all kinds yeah. of um, because this this stage needs elevation and it just will continue to grow and expand as we as we, you know, you know, gain more, you know, friends and followers and allies on, on this on this topic. So thank you so, so much. And if folks want to you. you or, you know, get in touch with the movement or follow the movement, how best can they do that? Just go to houseofbeautifulbusiness.com. Mm -hmm. um, that's the house website. If you're interested in our festival, it's enter the dream dot house, enter the dream dot house. You can look me up at timlebrecht.com. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. I'd love to hear from, from all of your listeners. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, please get in touch. Awesome. And you guys know where to find me at the metabusiness.world on social media at I am Aaron Patton. This has been another amazing episode of the Meta Business Millennial. And I look forward to seeing all of you on our next cast. I love you so much. Peace. Did you really love this episode of the Meta Business Millennial podcast? Well, I am honored and I appreciate you subscribing, leaving a review and sharing it with your friends because your feedback allows us to co-create more enlightened conversations. And if you're interested in growing your soul now, head over to my website, aaronpatton.com to find all the show notes, links, and free resources to get your energy activated today. In the meantime, stay bright, my friends. Much love and light. Peace. Peace.